Now, 300 million jobs globally could be impacted by artificial intelligence. This is according to recent Goldman Sachs research. At greatest risk of becoming replaced by AI are lawyers and administrative staff. The good news is that though most people would not be replaced by AI. 63% of the workforce will not see significant automation. But on the other hand, 7% of U.S. workers are at risk of replacement. The research also says AI could actually lead to a productivity boom, could increase the global GDP by 7% in 10 years. And joining me is Alexander de Ritter. He's the co-founder and visionary for InkForAll.com. Now, the reason I wanted to talk to you today, Alex, um, you know, with, with AI developing so fast, you know, are you worried at all about jobs being replaced? Maybe let's start off with what kind of jobs uh, will be affected or will be replaced in the future by AI? Uh, thank you for having me today. So uh, the world is going to go through three main phases of, auto, of, uh, of, of, of economic replacement. The first one is going to be knowledge work. The second one is going to be manual labor. And the third one is going to come to a post-scarcity society when it comes to resources. Um, they're going to, the first two waves are really already underway and they're starting. And will initially the first phase of knowledge work it will be um it will be first human augmentation it means that with less people you can do more now that actually does not mean less employment it just means more competition more startups faster pace and so everything we think um we think is going fast today will basically go even faster and you'll be able to make great companies with less people. Um, this phase after this is going to be where we're going to see a little bit of a different uh, trend where AI is going to start working alongside humans, not just a tool for us, but a tool that can use other tools just like humans can and can collaborate with each other and with us. Uh, I believe that this will have a societal impact, um, particularly on um, economies that are developing and rely heavily on things like outshoring, offshoring. So um, onshore economy, offshoring leads to a lot of economic boosts for some countries. They make a lot of revenue from uh, Western countries or developed nations investing in their country. And so there is something I believe that will happen is called the great reshoring. And there's many reasons why why that will develop. At the same time, um, we believe that over time, this will stabilize. And so humans will find new things to do that they are uniquely qualified for. A big reason for that is the what I call the economic theory of artificial intelligence. And uh, if, you, if you're very impressed what AI can do, that's wonderful. However, it also has an economic cost. You have to pay servers, it costs energy, processing units, data warehouses, lots of money too, to keep those things up and running. At some point, I believe we will discover that from a cost reward point of view, humans are actually very impressively optimized for uh, efficient processing and as an intelligence. And we strike a very sweet spot balance that uh, computers may not have the same uh, mix of reward um, versus cost. And so I believe that humans are ultimately going to find their sweet spot in that new economy. At the same time, you see trends happening in automation. Already it has transformed logistics, warehousing, and if you look at what Tesla is doing with their Gigafactory, it is transforming manufacturing as well. And um, and you see other manufacturers trying to keep up, trying to catch up with that, right? Trying to transform their manufacturing processes and bring them into uh, the current century. And then finally, when uh, labor becomes um, becomes commoditized from knowledge work and physical work, then you have a next frontier and that will be raw material to make stuff you need raw material today a lot of that comes from 
limited minds that we have and it creates geopolitical tensions and, and, and monopolies over different resources like cobalt and lithium. In the future, that also promises to be um, moving into a post-scarcity society when we're looking at things like space mining. Okay, so, uh, so a lot to talk about here. Um, on the jobs aspect, you mentioned uh, earlier in your answer. Now, uh, it seems like you're saying some jobs will be, in fact, uh, be replaced. But I wonder if the net number of jobs uh, will be the same. Maybe talk a little bit on, on that. Yeah, so it, it's very interesting that there are certain things that we take for granted today, like a weekend. That was not always the case in history. Uh, for a large part of history, people would just work seven days and they would lo work long hours. And there was not this concept of, of workday versus weekend. I see that in the future, humans can move more to maybe a four, four, uh, four workday week uh, and then move to a three workday week, where in that extra time, we have more time to express ourselves in our humanity or hobbies or passions. And, and I have discovered in my entrepreneurial career that sometimes when you take time called clarity time, to kind of step away. You also tend to be at your most creative. And you and I believe that that can also unlock a new wave of innovation for new entrepreneurs that come up who have these opportunities because now they have the time to combine their hobby with innovation. And when they would start a company today, employees can be quite expensive to have. Maybe it is possible in the future to just have two or three friends that you're really passionate, uh, that you share a passion with and have a vision for. And then with a low budget, create incredible things. And so I do not believe that in the end, humans will not be without work. Rather, I believe that the world would just move a lot faster and we'll be able to do a lot more than we do today. But I also think it's going to create opportunities for people to have more balanced lives and choose how they want to spend their time. Okay, I see. I, I guess you're sort of saying that with more advanced AI, it doesn't necessarily mean higher unemployment. I guess uh, that's sort of what you're saying. Um, there was another aspect that you talked about. You're saying AI could sort of work alongside humans and use tools like humans will be able to use tools. Now, should we be worried about that? I mean, if you look at a popular popular culture, we see, you know, movies like iRobot, we see like Terminator. Should we be worried about this? Well, we should absolutely think about that. Um, the, the reality of it is though, that there's no putting the toothpaste back in the tube when it comes to innovation. Um, humans will uh, create this technology the question is rather, how do we do it in a safe way? And so we need to create some regulatory standards, just like uh, data protection laws have been enacted around the world. We have to create some regulatory standards uh, in partnership with the industry and the researchers to ensure that bad actors do not use AI for nefarious purposes. And, you know, of, in the United States, people really are familiar with this debate. Um, most people will agree that having um, that having ability for self-defense is on its own a good thing. Most reasonable people will also agree that those things can be used for bad purposes and, and create societal problems. And that there is a balance to be struck between the, the needs of uh, protection in society as well as self-defense. Uh, the same will be true for artificial intelligence. And I believe the coming years, we will hear a lot, a lot of debate and back and forth going about that. Ultimately though, uh, we need to agree on a constitution for or regulatory framework for what we deem societally as a society acceptable for this and how we believe this technology should be used. 
Now, Alex, how far are we away from the kind of AI that we're seeing in, in the movies, in popular culture? How far are we away from artificial general intelligence, in your opinion? You know, that's a, that's a question that no matter how I answer, somebody will completely agree with me and completely disagree, and somebody else will completely disagree. But here's the thing. It, it, is, uh, it is a question that, that depends, that, an, that you answer differently depending on what you believe that means. And so uh, of GPT-4, the latest iteration from OpenAI, uh, they say that it displays the sparks of artificial general intelligence. And, and let's just look at what happened last week. Last week, OpenAI released uh, or announced the ability for GPT-4 to use tools. Tools like Wolfram Alpha. Tools like browsing the web. If you think about a human being, an intelligence, what can it do once they know how to operate a plow? Well, a few years later, you start getting cities. Then you get civilization. What happens when humans learn to make books? Well, a few hundred years later, we put a person on the moon because we know how to share knowledge. So do not underestimate the ability of artificial intelligence combined with tools to do things that we do not perceive as possible today. Things that will completely change our perception of what is possible. I think that artificial general intelligence uh, will further uh, be, be developed. And this year, we are getting huge steps forwards in that area. First of all, um, Multimodal models are able to understand text as well as images, audio, video, and more. But there is another element to this, and this is also multi-embodiment. Ability to operate in the physical world is a very big milestone. DeepMind from Google, for example, has released a model previously called Gato, and Gato is a uh, multimodal, multi-embodied, kind of model that can do many, many different tasks. We're looking forward to Gato 2, uh, perhaps later this year. This trend will accelerate. And at some point we will say, yes, obviously we have artificial general intelligence, but it will be very hard to pinpoint exactly when that moment happened. Because in some definition, we have already started that journey. And by other definitions, we are very close. And yet, by the most extreme definitions, we're maybe seven to 20 years out. Well, I think you make a really good point there. Uh, just fi one final question, and this is a philosophical question. So as AI develops more and more, and, and it can do most things that humans can do and think the way that humans can think, where's the line between a human and an AI? Where, where, where do you, where's the difference for you? This is very philosophical. Yes. Um, well, I think there is an importance uh, to your lived experience. And I, I often summarize my answer to a question like this as such. I would say an AI can't bleed. It, it, is, it is not possible uh, to really empathize and understand the suffering of animals, for example unless you yourself can have those same feelings of pain and experience those same things. In some way, artificial intelligence uh, can only reproduce a second-hand experience, whereas humans have a first-hand experience to knowing what it is like to be part of the earth and one with the nature around us. And that is a way that humans can experience. We also operate as humans, we are actually far more advanced than most people realize. Uh, for example, uh, scientists are studying the epigenome of humans now, understanding that we have incredible hardware that is not necessarily all activated all at once, and that there is a software layer on our cells that, that programs 
uh, how our cells express themselves and how the DNA expresses themselves. It is absolutely fascinating how adaptable humans are. And then I would also say, in, in general, when it comes to human and artificial intelligence, uh, you know, we have all gone to school at some point and specialized in a topic. And we also know that our brains cannot necessarily um, function if we had to study every single topic of the world. It wouldn't be efficient. So likewise for artificial intelligence, while it is true that you can build a general model with a generalist knowledge, there's also very much the need for the world to create highly specialized smaller models. For example, the robot vacuum that helps to clean your home and knows how to find its way around the home. And so by, by collaborating with each other and understanding that different entities can have different strengths and weaknesses, I believe we as humans will also better get to know ourselves through AI and understanding how we are different. And perhaps we will come to a society that is more human friendly because let's face it, I don't think humans were made to sit in a cubicle in concrete walls for hours and hours. I think there is much more to humanity than just that. And it is that innovation with artificial intelligence and that part of it that really excites me about the future. Because for the first time in many years, we truly have an opportunity to rethink about the society we want to create where humans can thrive and live optimal lives. I thank you, Alex, for the discussion today. It was such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having me.